So welcome Alexis and Alexi and Susanna, Stefani, Erez, Fanri, Rigni, and Adam. So let me um, share my desktop and let's go ahead and work out the quiz. All right, so here's the quiz. And we have the surface, x squared plus y squared plus z squared. I say x squared plus y squared plus three z squared equals one. And first we wanna convert this equation to cylindrical coordinates and solve for z. So I think it's probably helpful to, um, to do this actually in equation mode. So let me, um, we have x squared plus y squared plus three z squared equals one. So let's write that out. x squared plus y squared plus 3z squared equals 1. And we want to convert to cylindrical coordinates. All right, so since we want to go to cylindrical coordinates, what gets changed in this equation? So what do we change? What gets converted? Some gets converted, some doesn't actually get touched at all in the conversion. Yeah, the x squared plus y squared is r squared. So I can rewrite this as r squared plus z, 3z squared equals one. And then I asked you to solve for z. So that's easy to subtract our square, divide by three and take a square root. So Z equals, and I guess uh, technically plus or minus, when you take a square root, you get plus or minus. And that is there. Plus or minus the square root of uh, one minus R squared over three. Any questions, any questions at all on part A? Any questions? Okay, now let's get to part B. So part B, similar. We start out, I'm gonna get into equation mode. So we have X squared plus y squared plus 3z squared equals 1. All right. What would you like it to be instead of x squared plus y squared plus 3z squared? How would we like to transform this? A square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared. Not a, don't need the square root, but we just don't want that three there. <laughs> oh, you subtract it. Yeah, you could, well, if you subtract the three, that's not gonna help, but we can separate the three z squared into z squared plus two z squared. So I could just rewrite this as x squared plus y squared plus z squared. In other words, write down what you want and then see what, what you have to do to make it actually be the same. So we're missing a plus two z squared equals one. All right, what's x squared plus y squared plus z squared? Yeah, that's the row squared. So I'm gonna hit row and squared and plus we have two z squared. Do you remember what z is?
Yeah, that's rho cosine of phi. So that's rho, whoops, rho squared, because we have a squared. Cosine squared of phi. And phi is there. And still equal one. Any questions on that? All right, uh, since I've used a lot of space, let me insert the equation. And now let's go to the next line. What can we do to that to simplify this? We want to solve for rho. And to solve for rho, how do we do that? What can we do to the left hand? Yeah, we can factor out a rho squared. So let's do that. And you can get rho squared 1 plus 2 cosine squared phi equals 1. So let's write that out. Rho squared times 1 plus 2 cosine squared of phi equals 1. And then the last thing to do is, or last two things, is just divide by 1 plus 2 cosine squared phi and take a square root. And we get rho. equals the square root of 1 over 1 plus 2 cosine squared of phi. Any questions on question one? Any questions? Okay. And by the way, had I asked you um, which is the best coordinate system, that's a tough one. <laughs> that's why I didn't ask, because they're all kind of rough. Yeah. I, um, how big a deal is a positive negative square roots? Yeah, it turns out typically for um, when you're talking about z, you usually go plus or minus. When you're talking about rho, because that's a distance from the origin, you usually keep that positive. But I tend not to get picky on that. In the real world, you decide what works for your particular situation that you're working on, whether it's engineering or whatever it might be. So that almost really depends on the application you're working with. And since this is pure math, I kind of went somewhat standard and that is Z can be positive or negative, but rho tends to be positive because it's a, again, a radius or a distance from the origin. Um, but I would not take off points if you've got the plus or minus on that one. Okay, or if you put in a plus or minus, that's fine. So yeah, it's a good question. It's kind of technical. And I think I'm gonna like just ditch the question and say, when you get into engineering, you can, you know, see what works in engineering. <laughs> okay, or whatever you happen to do. Okay, let's go to question two. So consider the point giving in spherical coordinates, 12, pi over 4, pi over 6. So that's rho, theta, and phi. Write the coordinates in rectangular coordinates first. All right, so let's do A first. I think I can do it on the same screen and we can see it. Okay, so let's go rectangular coordinates. And now you gotta remember how you convert. So what is X equal to? R cos, uh, I mean, rho cos theta. Yep, and rho is 12, but a little more. 12 cosine of theta, pi over four. But there's more to it, there's one more piece. Sine of yes. phi. Sine phi. Sine of pi over six. And then y, the good thing about 
I'm doing it this way as I can copy and paste. What's the only difference in X and Y? Change the cosine to sine. Yeah, change the cosine to sine. Very easy. So with typing, since that's what you got to do, you just copy paste. And then Z, Z we actually already talked about in the last problem. So Z was equal to rho, which is 12, times the cosine of phi, which is pi over 6. And just because this looks so awful, let's make it a little prettier. I wouldn't take out points if you didn't, but I don't know, this just wants to be fixed. So cosine of pi over 4 is root 2 over 2. Sine pi over 6 is 1 half. So you get root 2 over 4. 12 over 4 is 3. So you get 3 root 2. And let's have an extra C there. So similarly, sine pi over 4 um, is actually the same as cosine. So that will be exactly the same. You get 3 square root of 2. And then 12 pi over 6 will be 12 times root 3 over 2, which is 6 root 3. That's a lot prettier. I wouldn't take out points if you didn't do that piece, but you know, it just looks nicer. Okay, now we want to go for cylindrical coordinates. So the idea you have the two choices. One is to use spherical to cylindrical, but I think that's a bit harder, except for one piece of it. And the other is to use rectangular to cylindrical, since we have rectangular right here. And that's one reason why I simplified the rectangular coordinate piece. So the first thing is for part B, the cylindrical coordinates, we need, um, we need R. And R is x squared plus y squared and take a square root. Any questions on that? So notice that's just 3 square root of 2 squared plus 3 square root of 2 squared. And that's, um, so 9 times 2 is 18, plus another 18 is 18 and 18 is 36. Square root of 36 is 6. OK, so that's our r. Now our theta, the good news is we know our theta. We don't do anything. Why, why do we immediately just know our theta? Yeah, it's given right here as pi over 4. Yeah, you don't need to do this arcan stuff. Look, theta is pi over 4. It's the same th spherical and cylindrical are the same theta. So it's pi over 4. You don't need to use any kind of formula. And z is just this guy. It's the same z. So it turns out once you have um, spherical and rectangular, it's pretty easy to jump into cylindrical because your theta and your z are immediate. There's given. Any questions on the quiz? Because that was the last question, I believe. Yep. Any questions? OK, a lot of formulas. Um, again, the main thing that comes up is use rectangular when rectangular is the best, use cylindrical when cylindrical is the best, and use spherical when spherical is the best. Okay, and as I've mentioned before, cylindr cylindrical is done a lot in um, electrical engineering because of wires tend to be, you know, straight and Oh, my quiz will be submitted in five minutes, it says. Wires tend to be straight. And also, um, the magnetism is related to how far from that wire is. And you get, a, you get things that look cylindrical-ish. Whereas spherical, obviously with spheres, or anything in physics, we're dealing with something where that is proportional to the distance from a point. So that could be if you have a light bulb, for example. And you want to understand the, 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 um, the light from the light bulb, you know, photons. 
then that has it's proportional to um, you know I think one over the square one over the square of the distance or maybe cube I forget but the point is is that it it's proportional to how far you are away from the light bulb okay and same thing with many things gravity is the same thing is that if you have gravity and you want to find out you know if you want a nice model and you have some point or some object that's giving that gravity, you tend to use spherical, okay? Rectangular you use when you're doing rectangular stuff. <laughs> Any questions on kind of that idea of when to use what? So they all come up, okay? They definitely all come up. All right, so let's pop into the webinar or the the agenda and all that. And let me ask you, are there any questions about homework or about anything else that's coming up? Still have a little while for the exam, but it's start, time to start thinking about it a little bit. Any questions? Give you a second to think about your questions because we actually don't have that intense a day today. Today's one of the lighter days. Okay, Monday, I don't think Monday's hard, but Monday is really important because it's the first day of calculus for a while. And today's our last day of no calculus, of just analytic geometry. So, any questions? I don't see any questions, but be happy to answer. Okay, so if there's no questions, then I will move on. And let me ask you, I think I asked you this once already, but I'm going to ask you again because it's, it's the most important thing of all mathematics, okay, post-arithmetic, and that is who remembers the definition of a function? Okay, so for each X, you get just one Y. That doesn't work actually. So for example, that does not work for parametric equations because for every X, you get many Y's often and that can still be a function. Because- Written here. <laughs> yeah, because- um, Oh, sorry, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I just want to mention for each X, you get just one Y. That's like the old version where you were stuck in X's and Y's, but- we're moving on, okay? And in fact, again, a week or so, a week or two ago, we talked about parametric equations at which you don't get, which you don't have a unique Y for every X because you tend to let the domain to be T and not X. Okay, so you said you have the idea of a function? Yeah, I wrote it down <laughs> when good, you were good. saying it. A map that sends every element from a domain set to a unique element of a range set. Actually, I think I'm typing it out, but I think I wrote it down just below. There we go. So a function is a mapping, map or mapping, I don't really care, from a domain set to a range set, such that every element of the domain is you map to a unique element of the range. There's different ways of wording it, but that's basically it. Um, you don't want to get fixed on X and Y. And that's a big, big deal in this class because our functions are not about X and Y for the domain and range, okay? Everything changes in this class. So this is where it's, it's hard to get used to a change, but the reason why you learned it before as for every X, you get just one Y is that works for 80% of the people in high school. How come? They're not becoming engineers and they only need to get up to like a certain math that doesn't involve, uh, I guess, the other elements. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Because only about 20% get to this class. If you're fine up to second quarter calc, 
um, but you're not fine in this class. So what I wanna do is I wanna talk about the, the different functions that can happen. And let me start out with the one that, you know, you, you learn in high school because that works for 80% of the people. It, it's the one you use a lot, um, but it's not the only one. So the key is we wanna talk about the domain. And so this is, let me get um, basic. And that is the domain is, I don't have an equation yet, there we go, R1. And the range is also R1. Okay, so if you're talking about just basic functions, then that for every X, you get a Y, that works just fine, okay? And that's great for 80% of the population in high school, okay? The problem is, is that you're not the 80%, 80%. I don't know if you realize that, but the farther you get along, the more special you all are, <laughs> okay? You're becoming the, the top students of all of Lake Tahoe Community College, just let you know that. Um, and next year, if you take second year calc, you will be the most advanced students. So just to note, um, so you're, you're past basic already. Okay, so that's basic and that's XY plane stuff, okay? Then what did we learn about in uh, a couple weeks ago? What kind of functions? Yeah, para, parametric. <laughs> parametric, and that is the domain is R1, and the range, what was the range? Yeah, it could be R2, but it could also be R3, remember? So it could be R2, it could be R3. And as I mentioned, but I didn't do any examples of, you could have R20 if you want. So I'm gonna write Rn, where N is any integer, any, uh, sorry, whole number. Okay, so n is any whole number greater than one. Any questions on parametric equations? Okay, not spend a lot of time on it because we already did them. We spent a whole day on them. All right, so we have r1 to r r1 to r1. We have r1 to rn. What else might there be? Any thoughts? Okay, yeah, there's true M to M and I'm gonna, I'm gonna wait on that one a bit. But an another special one. Any thoughts? Okay, so I don't see it. We haven't done them yet. That's what today is gonna to be all about. And that's functions of several variables. And that's domain is Rn. And the range is R1. where, let me just copy and paste, where n is any whole number greater than one. Any questions on these three types so, so far? 
Okay. Eras mentioned RM to RM. That also does come up. Any guess on when that's going to come up? And I'm going to say RM to RN because they don't have to be the same letters, actually. You could have R2 to R7, for example. Any guess on when that'll come up? Here's a hint, you're not gonna hear from me. I don't see y'all jumping in. All right, well, if you don't got one to guess, I'll tell you. That's gonna come up next quarter, yeah. That's the Math 202 class, which Bruce will be teaching, by the way. Um, so Bruce is set up to teach the Math 202 class. So um, you'll get it from him, and you'll get what happens when you're going from, you know, RM to, you know, RM. And in particular, uh, not even R. We're going to be looking at things like R, he, or he'll be looking at things like R3 to V3. What do you think V3 is? Any thoughts? What do you think V might stand for, which we've had in this class? Yeah, vectors. So the domain and range don't even have to be in, in real number stuff. They can be vector, vector stuff, and that would be a vector valued function, okay? You could even get weird and you can let the domain be people <laughs> and maybe the range be numbers. You know, for every person, you can talk about how old they are. That would be a person, people to numbers. Does that make sense? So you could actually get really creative with functions. Okay. And that does happen a lot, by the way. But what we're talking about today are functions of several variables. So we're going to start out with a function of two variables. And let me put it in red because that's the definition. So here's a function of two variables. A function of two variables is a function where the domain is R2 and the range is R1. Any questions on that idea? Okay, when, when might that happen in the real world? Can you think of an example where you might have a function of two variables? Coordinate. All right, but what would the function be? I'm looking for a real world example. Latitude and longitude. <laughs> Okay, latitude and longitude, those are two variables, but what's the function? You need a function. Would it be right. in degrees? Okay, yeah, it could be temperature. The temperature. Um, on, how about in the US? In the US where XY, might be um, is latitude, longitude. I'll just write lat and long. And we look at the temperature at any location. Any questions on that idea? Can you think of another example? There are lots, by the way. Like maybe the engineering example. So we got a meteorology example. How about a engineering example? The rate of water. 
Um, the Raiders. In, what like one hundred? one side of the stream versus the other side of the stream. Ugh. That would still be one variable because then you're talking about the side of the stream and that's a one variable. Okay, the, the I guess, flow rate of water in between different rivers. <laughs> um, probably not to the, uh, I'll do the flow rate of water, but not side of stream. So the flow okay. rate of a stream at any point on the stream. So you don't have to go one side or another, just any point in the stream. So for example, and th this is actually, I don't know if you've, if, if you're at LTCC and you're in Tahoe, I can give you an example that you might've seen. And if not, you should, because it's beautiful. And that is um, what, if you, if you walk about a um, couple hundred meters from the college, what do you get to see? It's beautiful, that's a hint. Uh, no, lake is a lot more than a couple hundred. Yeah, the, uh, it's not quite a river. It's a, it's a, it's a sewage plant. I'm, I said beautiful. <laughs> Maybe you think the sewage plant is beautiful. <laughs> but uh, yeah, Trout Creek. It's called a creek, not a river, by the way. But that's just, you know, not, that's just language, not math. Um, so if you look at Trout Creek, for example, then at any point on Trout Creek, there's going to be a flow rate on Trout Creek. And that's going to change whether you're you know, crossing or, or going up or downstream, everywhere, it really changes a lot. And I wanna just mention something. It's kind of very sad actually, um, is that one of my best students ever from about 22 years ago um, did his presentation project on the flow rate of Trout Creek and looked at that using calculus you know, for this class. And why it's sad is, um, he became a meteorologist. He worked for um, he worked for the um, National Geographic, and he was studying tornadoes. And unfortunately, it took him. So I'm almost crying. It was really, really sad. Um, but that was his actually project, and it was a beautiful project because he looked at the flow rate of the stream on Trout Creek and looked at that as a function of two variables. Any questions on that idea? And then what he did is based on that, he looked at if TRPA wanted to redesign Trout Creek or reroute Trout Creek so that there'd be less erosion and less um, sediment into the lake, how, would, how might they do that? So that's the kind of stuff that people do in the real world in even in Tahoe. Any questions on that idea? Okay, so I want to mention that there are a lot of, there are a lot of applications of this. Okay, I'm going to give you another one too that I typically like, but I'm going to do that a little in a little bit. Okay, so let's do some uh, just boring examples. So I'm going to call them math examples. So Functions, what letter do you usually use for a function? X. No, a function is F. <laughs> X is a variable. F is a function, right? Right, F of X. Yeah, but not F of X because there's a function of two variables, F of X comma Y. So this is what you have to get used to. We're moving up. It's not going to be F of X anymore because F of X is a function of one variable. So now we're looking at f of x, y, because you got to give me two numbers. You got to give the function two numbers for it to give back a new number. So f of x, y might be something like x minus y squared. And that would be a function of two variables. Do you agree? If you yes. give me two numbers, I can give you a number that the function spits out. So that's a function of two variables, very simple. Any questions on this idea? Okay, in this class, we're gonna go a lot beyond just like reading it. What do you think we might do thinking this is called calculus? 
do calculations. Now it's called calculus. What, what's the main thing in calculus? Oh, integrate it. <laughs> okay. Um, well, it turns out integrate is a good answer, but not this quarter. That's next quarter. <laughs> That's math 202. So what did we do? What do you start with in calculus? Yeah, you take derivatives. And even before that, what do you take? Limits. Limits. So in this class, we're going to be looking at limits and derivatives. In Math 202, if you continue on to the next course, then you're going to learn about, um, about derivative, about integrals. And in particular, we're going to, you're going to call those double integrals because you have two variables, but not, not in our class. But I will let you know that we, there's going to be a lot of calculus. Today is the last day without calculus. So starting on Monday, we're going to start doing the calculus of these things. Right now, we're just going to learn what they are, and we're going to look at the basics of them, which is still not necessarily easy, because we got to say, well, how do you graph it? Could you graph this? What do you think? Do you think you could graph it using like what you did when you first learned how to graph functions of one variable to good old basic functions by just a t-table, plotting some points and connecting the dots? Do you think that'll work? What do you think? So do you think plotting the points and connecting the dot, the t-table, plotting the points and connecting the dots will work? Any thoughts? I don't see y'all jumping in. <laughs> What's your guess? You think that would work? Because you could do a T table. Not that hard to draw a T table. I can insert a table. And I don't know, I'll just do some table. We're going to have X, Y. It won't be a T table anymore. It'll be a, because there's X and Y, F of X, Y. And let's plug in some points. How about zero, zero? What's f of zero, zero? Take a look. Here's our f. Not Could a trick question. Zero? Yeah, it's just zero. Zero minus zero squared is zero. OK, I'm not going to throw in miserable stuff. And then you could plug in, say, x is 1, y is 0. And what is f? One. One. How many of these do you think you're going to need before you get a really good idea of what this thing looks like? There's going to be an I R3, think, by the way. Huh? I think this is enough. But like, you could also get a third, oh, you think like a enough? bigger point. No, no, no. Get a larger number. How many? A lar <laughs> yeah, I like Alexi's answer. A ton. A ton. Hundreds. OK? We're talking three-dimensional space. It's not like, you know, just graphing a parabola where you can do five or six points, you get the idea. This is not going to work for humans. Why did I use the word humans? Okay, and because not because- a computer can do it faster, yeah. faster than we can. <laughs> yeah, not because aliens are going to do it, by the way. <laughs> and your dog or cat's not going to do it either. Um, but computers can do it. So instead, because this will be absolutely miserable, to plot points, enough of them, so you get a feel for what this looks like. So a t-table is a bad idea. Do you all agree? So it's such a bad idea, I am actually going to erase it because it's so horrible. But I want to let you know, you could do it that way. If you had you know, a year to kill and you really cared about it, <laughs> it might take a year. But instead, let a computer do it. A computer could do you know, hundreds and hundreds of these in, in a, you know, a second. So in particular, we can pop a computer in. And by the way, this was f of x, y is x minus y squared. So I just pop in f of x, y, which is called z, x minus y squared. 
And how long did that take? I think two seconds. Yeah, I don't think even two seconds. I think more like a couple milliseconds in terms of the computer part. The computer actually, you know, plotted in the points. But what it really did is it plotted points. Can you see it? So each one of these on these little square things is a plotted point. And that's how the computer does it. It literally is making a T table, plotting the points, and then connecting. Any questions on that? Okay, and in fact, you can even see it. So one reason why CalcPlot 3D, there's a lot of stuff you can do with it, is we can click on that. And not only can I plot points, but I can actually watch a point move along. You have to kind of see it, there we go. So you can see how a point moves as I move along in, as I change X and Y. Do y'all see that going on? So notice uh, if Y gets large, we get like drop down there on that um, right-hand side. If X gets large, then that goes across this way. Any questions on that? Okay, so computers are much better, much better at this than people. Okay, remember people still, um, still program this. Do you think I'm the one that programmed it? What do you think? Any guesses? You programmed the function, but not the, the calc plot. Yeah. Unless I you were part it. of the calc plot original programming team, but. Yeah, um, it turned out Paul, um, who I work with actually, and I was actually on this project, but I wasn't the programmer. Uh, Paul Seberger programmed this guy. Nice guy. In fact, we actually emailed each other today, believe it or not, um, just coincidentally. Um, about something different. So the point is, is that you need a programmer to do this. So it's really important, again, knowing computer programming, you could do a lot. Okay, so Paul's a good guy, lives on the other side of, of the coast, in the east, east coast, I think uh, some Maryland or somewhere like that. And uh, he programmed this, uh, a lot of work to program it, but once it's programmed, you've got it. And then you can see this beautiful, beautiful surface. Any questions on that? You could still talk about passing the vertical line test, by the way, but it's a different vertical line than you learn in um, high school when you're talking about vertical line test. And the cool thing is it's a true vertical line in the world. So now we're talking about a vertical line, which means parallel to the Z axis. And if you take a line parallel to the Z axis, then it will cross the surface at most once. Any questions on that? Okay, so that was an example and not too bad. So the different choices is you can use CalCLOT 3D and look at it in three dimensions, which is nice. There's another way too. And I'm gonna show you, uh, do we have anyone that um, like me loves to hike? Yeah. Okay, so if you, if you love to hike, okay, and if you live in Tahoe, we have some of the best hiking in the whole world, then a lot of people will ask me, because I'm a big hiker, um, you know, how far is it to hike to Lac, Mount Talac? Okay, and if someone from Kansas asked that, and I told them six, you know, oh, it's, it's a, you know, four mile, five mile hike to get there. Why does that not tell the whole story? Like, that sounds easy. I could do four miles. You're not giving them elevation. Yeah, there's <laughs> up, 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 okay? When I hiked to Yosemite from my house, by the way, um, if it was just 150 miles, that would have been nothing. But it wasn't just hiking 150 miles. It was a lot of ups, okay, and a lot down too. Um, and that's kind of how it is if you do the PCT. So those who hike, how do they, how, how is that drawn? So then what you do is you have a function of two variables where you have the latitude and longitude are your X and Y, and then your 
your Z is the elevation, right? But they don't use CalcPlot 3D, right? A hiker and a map does not look at some three-dimensional thing like I just looked at. What do you look at? How is that shown? So every hiker understands it. Okay, at least every hiker that understands safety. <laughs> yeah, topogra topographical. So let me show you. So here's um, one of my favorite places, and that is Desolation Wilderness. And if you haven't been there, I strongly recommend if, if you like hiking, that that's a great place to go. In fact, I built some of the trails. Um, that's another thing I like to volunteer for the TRTA. And what you can see is um, the map people call it topographical map. The mathematicians call it contour diagrams. Okay, same thing. It's the same thing. So this now shows you not just the latitude longitude, but actually you have these lines that go through. So for example, right here in between lower Velma and middle Velma, which is an absolute beautiful place. Um, I've, I've actually uh, camped right here many times. And you'll see there is this line. And if you follow this line, you'll see 7,800. What does that mean, that number 7,800? Yeah, that's the elevation. Okay, so in particular, what you can do is you can draw this contour diagram or this topographical map, and you can get more than just, you know, how many miles is it from Lake Tahoe to Lower Velma, because it's not, actually not very many miles. Okay, I don't know if this map shows you by miles, but it might, let's see, yeah. So that's one mile from here to here. So if you look at miles from Tahoe to uh, Lower Velma, it's only about two miles. Sounds like a really easy hike, doesn't it? Okay, except that's not the way you go. You would never walk like this. And why wouldn't you walk like this? to go from here to here to get to Lower Velma. What's the problem? What's the problem with doing the straight line path? Water it will be in your way. <laughs> um, no, no water to go from here to here. But then you'll have to cross like, I mean, I've never been up there, so, but I'm assuming it's, it's a lot of hills. Here. Yeah, you don't have to have been up Way there. All you have hills. to do is mm -hmm. understand the contour diagram. And if you look, see where it says 29? Right here, this 29? What happens if you're walking over here? We're gonna be fighting mountains. Yeah, you're gonna be climbing a cliff, okay? Actually, not a steep cliff, that'd be a steep climb, okay? There's not a whole lot of drop, actually, when you go to Lower Velma. It's almost all climbing up. You're gonna climb a cliff. You gotta get way, way up there from not, from pretty low. And that's not the way you go. You tend to take a trail and the trail tries to go as somewhat along the contour lines. Like over here, you can see it's almost parallel to the contour lines. And that way you're not going a lot of up and down. You're going as flat as you can get. Okay, now you do have to go up because Lower Velma is a lot higher than Lake Tahoe, but it's, a lot better to do a trail. And you can see that from a contour diagram. So this is another way of depicting a um, function of two variables where this is the altitude is a function of latitude and longitude. Any questions on this idea here? Okay, and then what you always have to do is you have to make sure you write down the, um, the function's value, at least for some of the lines. So I know it's kind of small, but this says 7,800 here. This says 8,400 over here. So you can see what the elevation is or what the function's value is for different values of X and Y. Any questions on a contour diagram? 
Okay, just let you know we're not done with this. Okay, we're going to do other things like how steep it is. But a how steep is it? What does that sound like that you had first quarter? Yeah, derivative. So we're not ready today to do that. That's going to be next week, I believe, later next week. Um, we'll talk about the looking at a contour map and then understanding derivatives. It turns out to be plural, but that's another day. So I'll let you know, I'm giving you a heads up that that's the kind of stuff that we're going to be doing with these contour diagrams is we're going to be able to handle calculus of them. Any questions on that idea? All right, so let me just go through kind of the kind of a definition. It's a creating the contour de diagram definition. And that is, the first is you draw a T table where the left column contains values of the dependent variable and the right hand column contains the equation with two variables that gives the level curves for the corresponding equations. And then step two is graph the level curves on the XY plane and label them with their corresponding value of the dependent variable. So I think I want to do an example. I think it's worth it. I'm going to do one, um, at least some up by hand. I'll do my best. And let's suppose we do f of xy. Let's write a new equation. Equals x squared plus y squared. All right, um, first thing, this is something we did before, is in a word, what, what is this surface in one word? The hint is you can think of f of xy as z. And I think I put something very similar to this it's on the exam. Here? Mm, it's actually not a sphere, but a good try. I put I put one of these on the quiz last time. <laughs> Do you remember what it is? Mm, it's not a cylinder because we have a z equals x squared plus y squared. And uh, it's not a cone. That would be z squared equals x squared plus y squared. Keep trying. <laughs> You'll get there. There aren't that many words left. Good, paraboloid. Yeah, it's a paraboloid. Because z equals x squared is a parabola, z equals y squared is a parabola. Whereas if z is 1, x squared plus y squared would be a circle. That makes it a paraboloid. Any questions on that? OK, so now I'm going to insert a table. And maybe I'll do a bunch. So we're going to have x. I'm oh, sorry, we're going to have, um, actually, I only need, I don't need that column, just a minute. There we go. So what we're going to have is we're going to have z. And then we're going to have the curve. So 0 is always a good idea. And if z is 0, you get x squared plus y squared equals 0. By the way, what is x squared plus y squared equals 0? Now we're in the xy plane. There's only two variables. What's a graph of x squared plus y squared equals 0? Hint is it's very simple. Yeah, it's the origin. Okay, That's all it is. It's just the point, the origin. Let's go z equals 1. Then you get x squared. Oops. Let's go to equation. x squared plus y squared equals 1. What's the graph of x squared plus y squared equals 1?
in a word? A point. Mm, that one's not a point. X squared plus y squared is zero is a point. X squared plus y squared is one is a good, a circle. Okay, that's a circle. Circle of radius one. Okay, I'm gonna choose four for the next Z and you'll understand in a moment why. So if Z is four, then we get X squared plus Y squared equals four. Okay, now what is that and how is it different from the prior one? Bigger one. Yeah, Bigger it's a, but in particular, more specifically, the radius changes. Radius is two. It's a circle of radius two. So I'm gonna go nine for the next one. And we get x squared, one hit equation, x squared plus y squared equals nine. And hopefully you all know that's a circle of radius three, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, and I'm not gonna do this all day long, but hopefully you get the idea. So now I can draw it. So let's do it. So we're gonna have x, y axes. And I'm not gonna draw every mark because it takes forever to draw with this program. I'm just gonna go one and one. Okay, so the first thing is we're gonna have a point. I'm trying to think the best way might be scribbling. Okay, and that, if you remember, was z equal zero. Any questions on that? Then we're gonna have a circle. See if I can get it right. like so, and that's gonna have z equals two, as uh, z equals one, sorry. I kind of missed, so let's see if I can, there we go. Okay, and then you're gonna have another circle. And again, I'm not a perfect artist, but you get the idea. I'm much better at programming. <laughs> And that'll have z equals two. Uh, z equals four, sorry. Any questions on that? Okay. So by the way, if you if you're walking and you're starting here in the center, and you're going to here, and then you're going to here, are you? Is it the same steepness or are you increasing or decreasing how steep you're going? If you're starting at the origin, you're going to the right. Going um increasing? Yeah, you're increasing. Because you're on a positive x axis. It's not because of that. It's because to go from zero to one. Uh, actually, sorry, you're decreasing. You're decreasing your steepness. To go from zero to one, z changes by one unit of elevation. But to go from one to two, Z changes by um, uh, three units of elevation. So you're getting steeper and steeper and steeper. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Okay, so there's your picture. Isn't that beautiful? Okay, I do more, but I don't wanna waste your time. <laughs> 
Okay, I could do the nine also, but that's just another circle with another number. Okay, it's a lot easier to draw by hand actually. And it's a whole lot easier for me to actually program it and then do a beautiful picture, but, but we don't have the time for that. All right, so there's that example. Okay, so then we can talk about a function of more than two variables where the domain is Rn and n is greater than two, okay? And the range is R1. So by the way, in this, in this class, we stick to the range being R1. That changes next um, quarter in the next class. Can you think of an example, a real world example, where you have a function of more than two variables? There's lots and lots of them. Any thoughts? And there isn't just one example, there's literally unlimited. So can you think of an example where you're gonna have a function of say three variables? Okay, work required to bicycle from A to B. Okay, um, so let me, let me change it slightly. I think you get their idea. So maybe work required to um, bicycle to point B. Okay, where B, B now is in three dimensions. Okay, so B involves latitude, longitude, and elevation and then how much work it takes to bicycle to that point. Is that kind of what you're talking about? Yeah, we don't wanna say A to B because we don't wanna change both A and B, that becomes too messy. Then we're talking vectors and we're not doing vectors in this class. We're not doing vector value functions, that's next quarter. So if you're doing work required to bicycle from A to B, that would be something that is not a function of say three, vari three variables, that would be a vector value, uh, a function of a vector. Does that make sense? Um, so really, if you say, we're gonna always start in the same place, we wanna see how much work it takes to get to some other place, then that would be a function of um, three variables. So example, work required, to bike, to a point, okay, Inclu that includes possible elevation change. Okay, what are some? There's many examples I want to go through because they're really important. And they come up in lots and lots of places. I don't see y'all jumping in. Maybe I'll give you some. How about gravity? As you move from the sun. Okay, maybe I'll write force of gravity, sounds better. Okay, notice that that's, uh, any, a point is in three dimensions, like that's the universe. And in um, some versions of physics, the universe is three dimensional. Okay, I know that sounds weird just to say that. Um, any, anyone know what, you, where you got issues with this whole dimension where it's not three dimensional anymore? It was a really bright guy, ruined it for everyone. <laughs> Didn't really ruin it, but. You know, no? Einsteinian physics. So Einstein. So Einstein realized that basically time was part of the whole equation too. Okay. 
Um, so let me give you another example. How about temperature of a room? With the window open. On one side. And a heater on another. Okay. Is that a function of three variables? Yeah, that's a function of three variables because in any location, it's going to be a different temperature. If you're real close to the heater, Okay, and maybe I didn't write this, but I'm, I'm saying on a cold day, otherwise you wouldn't bother with a heater. Um, if you're real close to the heater, it's gonna be nice and warm. If you're real close to the window, it's gonna be really cold. And depending on where you are, it's gonna change. Okay, and that function is actually very complicated. Okay, um, but that's the kind of stuff you might do in engineering. Any questions on that example? Can you think of a function of hundreds of variables? That's used in the real world. Would it be computer code or satellite? Um. I'm not sure what the variables are and what the function is when you say computer code for satellite. I'm not sure what that means. Well, I meant like if you have a, if you send a satellite in space mm -hmm. to like track like earth locations. Okay, that'd be three variables because that's location. All right, maybe I'll give you an example. How about The profit that Safeway makes based on the um, prices of each of the items that it sells. Okay, so how many items does Safeway sell? How many types of things? What's your guess? I'm not asking for an exact number because I don't know it. A whole lot, yeah. How about hundreds, okay? <laughs> okay, do y'all agree that they sell hundreds of different items? So they sell hundreds of different items each item has a price. If you change the price of that item, that's gonna change the profit that Safeway makes. Do you agree? Okay. And you can look at, in a database, you definitely would not draw a graph of that function because good luck drawing something in hundreds of dimensions. But what you could do is you can put it in a database and you can track based on the price that Safeway does for all of the different items, what is the profit that they're gonna make? And by the way, what do you think Safeway's goal is? And it's not to make us happy, by the way. <laughs> What's their overall goal? Yeah, maximize profit. So I'll let you know that you have a function of hundreds of variables and what Safeway's goal is is to take those hundreds of variables, come up with the very best um, point, and a point means the prices for all of their different items so that they can maximize profit. Okay, did you learn about maximizing a function? Maybe uh, in my class a couple quarters ago, if you took me, or in Bruce's, or someone else's. Do you remember doing that? You were maximizing a function in calculus? You mean, so we put a limit to infinity? Um, that's not what you did in calculus to maximize something. 
You didn't take a limit to infinity. You took a very important word in first quarter calculus. Derivative. You took a derivative and then set the derivative equal to zero. Okay. Well, it's much more complicated if you're talking about a function of hundreds of variables because there isn't a single derivative, it turns out. And we'll get into that later in this class next month. And we'll talk about, or even in a few weeks, we'll talk about how do you maximize a function of multiple variables by thinking about derivatives, but we don't even understand what a derivative is yet for multiple variables. Okay, but I'm giving you kind of a, a heads up of what the whole point of this is all about. And that's a big point, not just to make money. <laughs> uh, making money is nice, you know, if you're a business owner, but sometimes you want to, if you're understanding physics, you might want to minimize um, energy because minimizing energy is kind of something that nature tends to do. If you're doing biology, you're going to maximize the, um, the fertility, right? The number of successful children a spe an animal has or a plant has. Um, but either way, you're going to be doing that kind of stuff and it's going to be of multiple variables. Any questions on these ideas? Okay. Do you think you can draw a graph of this function for Safeway? Any thoughts? I don't see y'all jumping in. So the answer is not a chance. <laughs> You're never going to be able to draw a graph of this. Okay. It just isn't going to happen. Do you think you might be able to do a graph in, of a function? Can you do, I'm going to write do a graph of a function of three variables? You think that's possible instead of hundreds? How about just three variables, X, Y, and Z? Any thoughts? Okay, and yes, okay, I see yes. Any suggestions how you might want to do it? And there's a couple approaches. They're very difficult, but they're not impossible and they're done. Any thoughts? I don't see y'all jumping in. So one way is to sketch, is it uh, with f of g type situation? That would be a um, composition of functions. You could do compositions, but that's not what I was asking. It was about just graph of a function. So one way is to not sketch level curves like you do for a contour diagram, but sketch level surfaces. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna basically do the same thing that you did for level curves. You're gonna set your different values for F, look at the surface for each of those that you get and then sketch the different surfaces. Any questions on that idea? Another way is brand new. When I say brand new, I mean, um, you know, it, it hasn't, it wasn't around 50 years ago. Any thoughts? It's kind of fun. Some of you might've experienced it. Let's see you jumping in. VR. Do you know what VR is? You know what that stands for? Virtual reality. Virtual reality. So, um, so you can do a vir literally a virtual reality, and then you have the person experience this this function of three variables by walking through it in their brain, okay, or with their vision. Um, 
very complicated, um, but really cool. I don't know if you've ever done a virtual reality machine, but that's basically a function of three variables. Okay. Okay, where time is, uh, is in there. Okay, any questions on all these ideas? So again, today's our last day where we're not doing, we're not doing um, kind of your classic calculus with derivatives and integrals and limits and all that. Um, so if you miss it, then we'll get back to it and you get to say hi to it again on Monday. And that's a big deal. But today is just introducing what these functions of multiple variables are, where the domain is not R1 anymore. The domain is Rn, where n might be two or three or much higher. Okay, and graphing is challenging, but can be done. And hopefully you understand the functions. Any questions at all? Okay, I think I'm gonna stop the share and stop the recording.